This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Start Battery Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get up to a $25 gift card after rebate with the purchase of select Super Start batteries. Our professional parts people will test your old battery for free and recommend the right battery for your vehicle. For power, performance, and reliability, choose Super Start batteries only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello there. Thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts. It's all about astronomy and space science. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and it's great uh, that you could join us again this week for another episode. Uh, today, we're going to be talking asteroids, uh, collisions that have been occurring uh, on various planets, but uh, the focus in this case has been on Mars because they've just released the results of a study into uh, 600 million years' worth of collisions, and they've found out something very interesting, which could be good to know because Mars being one of our neighbours is uh, in the same vicinity as us and uh, what we know about Mars could be helpful in terms of what we know about our own planet and there's a good reason for that. And uh, the rotation of stars has been studied um, and, and it's been rather revealing in terms of uh, how fast certain stars are spinning and uh, trying to understand stellar rotation which we still don't understand. Uh, we'll also be taking questions from Ken in Maroochydor about uh, focusing radio telescopes and Jacob in Phoenix about rogue planets. I assume they're exoplanets, although Earth could be considered a rogue planet, I'm sure, with everything that goes on here. And much, much more. Of course, uh, we can't do it without our good friend, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Good to see you and uh, to be talking to you this Sort of fine day. <laughs> yes, yes. Very overcast here, so, uh, uh, I, so I, st <laughs> I still haven't managed to get a decent night to take my telescope out for a bit of a look around. But um, I, I, I'm very patient. I'll, I'll be, I'll be waiting with bated breath. But uh, yeah, it's it's all good fun. Um, now, Fred, shall we get on to our first topic, and that is uh, the study of asteroid collisions on Mars. Now, they're looking back over a heck of a long period of time and they've found something interesting. That's right. Um, so, asteroids, you know, collisions by asteroids uh, has been taking place throughout the whole history of the solar system, 4.57 uh, billion years uh, that's how old the sun and planets are. And particularly in the early history of the solar system, you know, the, the whole place was a, uh, was a, a nightmare. There were, there were asteroids and protoplanets and planetesimals uh, charging about everywhere in this, in this disk of, of dust and, uh, and gas, which we call the protoplanetary disk. But of course, as the planets formed uh, and settled down, uh, that bombardment didn't just stop. Uh, and it, it basically tailed off because all the stuff that was there to crash into things got crashed into things and used up, although sometimes there were collisions between objects that created more asteroids. Mm. Um, but um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, what it means is that for a body um, without an atmosphere or with a very thin atmosphere, uh, the, 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 the record of craters on the surface of that body is uh, something that lets you provide dating for the surface itself. So uh, the, the mantra is that the, the more craters you have on a surface, the older that surface is. Uh, you're looking back further in time. And so um, you, can, you can actually see 
directly a comparison, almost with the naked eye, probably binoculars would help, when you look at the moon. Um, and the moon's southern highlands are very, very heavily cratered. They are, the, those craters date back to the, um, you know, the uh, what's called the late heavy bombardment about 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. Whereas when you look at the greyish areas, the maria, the seas, um, they are much more lightly cratered because it's a much more recent surface. Yeah. So that's the that's the the bottom line. But what scientists have done uh, over, I guess, recent decades, because this this um, science of crater counting uh, has uh, has been very much more refined. But what they've done is looked for um, periods when the cratering rate has got higher. Uh, and you can sort of do that by looking at the size of the craters, the typical size of the craters, because as as the debris that's impacting on a surface like the Martian surface, which is what they're really concentrating on, uh, as, the, as that debris uh, gets cleared out through the solar system, the impacting bits and pieces get smaller and smaller. And so you tend to have, you know, you can the, the, the most of the craters uh, that you would find being created within the last um, few million years would be much smaller than ones that were being created billions of years ago because the objects, the debris is smaller. Yeah. Um, but what people have been looking for is, as I said, the structure in the in the impact rate to see to try and see uh, if there were eras when there were many more impact craters than before, and and in fact that's sort of been the standard um, the the standard uh, rhetoric or logic that that the the the, the distribution of impact cratering over time has got spikes in it. So you've got times when uh, there's been a much higher frequency of asteroid collisions. That's that's what earlier studies have suggested, and that's been, as I said, the sort of standard model of what's going on. Yeah, makes now, sense. The reason, that, that, it, it'd be logical to think that, given the it, history of our indeed. solar system. That's exactly right. I, I feel um, the butt coming on. But yes, there is a but coming on, uh, and there is new work, new studies. Uh, actually, a study published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters, uh, which actually comes out of Curtin University here in Australia, uh, led by Dr. Anthony Legain. I think his name is. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I hope that's correct, Anthony. Um, he's at Curtin School of Earth and Planetary Science, Sciences, and he and his team have basically uh, used new algorithms. To, to look at the distribution of craters on the planet Mars. And to cut to the chase, the bottom line is um, that the, the rate of cratering has been pretty well uniform over the past 600 million years. And that is a surprise. That's the, the, that's the but that you just mentioned, yeah. uh, because people have thought that wouldn't be the case. Um, so uh, the, the, the reason why I guess you might expect spikes in the frequency of collisions is if you get two largish asteroids smashing into each other, then they and, – and we're talking now about principally asteroids in the main asteroid belt, which, of course, is right next door to Mars. Um, if you get two asteroids that, that collide uh, and smash up, that, what you get is a, a – is a, um, a, a collection of much smaller objects, the, the debris, um, and that you can imagine um, over time, uh, over a relatively short period of time, raining down on Mars uh, and creating uh, a spike in the in the astro in the um, impact crater distribution. Yeah. Um, however, uh, the studies that have been done. Uh, show, and this is uh, a quotation actually from uh, Anthony Legain, uh uh, past, um, sorry, when big bodies smash into each other, this is what I've just said, when big bodies smash, smash into each other, they break into pieces or debris, which is thought to have an effect on the creation of impact craters. Our study shows that it's unlikely that debris resulted in any changes to the formation of impact craters on planetary surfaces. In other words, you, you know, the fact that, yes, there are collisions, but that doesn't necessarily translate into more craters at a given time on Mars. Um, and 
the, the, this comes about with um, because of, as I said, a new algorithm which um, apparently uh, was created by a professor, Gretchen Benedicts. I don't know where Gretchen is, but that work is what has allowed this study uh, and uh, allowed the, these new insights. Uh, just one postscript to this, uh, Andrew, is that, of course, um, we on our own planet really don't have this this um, record of impacts uh, because of plate tectonics. The, uh, the, the, the motion of the continental plates actually erases uh, to a large extent the, the record of impacts on our planet. There are a few, uh, of course, a few well-known impact craters um, and you know you've only to think of the Chicxulub crater that you and I have thought to, spoken about a long, uh, very often, which is actually under the surface of the of the seabed in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. But th- those craters, um, generally speaking, on Earth they don't last very long because they just the the the, um, the tectonic plates slide over or under one another, and you and you, you actually get them rubbed out. Yeah. Uh, so being it, able to look at Mars and see what's been happening with them uh, or, or with it uh, gives perhaps yeah. some insight into what we've been exactly to and exactly. could continue to be subject to in the future. Yeah, well, that's right. That's why, you know, there's so much interest on uh, looking out for near-Earth objects. It's a, a, a kind of almost an industry now that's um, <laughs> quietly reassuring because there's a lot of telescopes looking out for these things. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, of course, the other thing about Earth is it's covered in water and vegetation. So even if there were impact points, they'd be well hidden a lot of the time. Yeah, although, you know, um, there are people have looked at tsunami records and things of that sort mm. uh, to, to deduce the past uh, history of impact on Earth. There's been a lot of studies on Earth, but but our generally speaking, our surface, the surface of our planet is not a good, uh, um, you know, storyteller of the impact rates on Earth just because of plate tectonics, because it's a, it's a constantly shifting thing uh, and the surface is constantly being renewed. That's the bottom line, really. Yeah. Well, we we saw some of that renewal the other day with that massive Absolutely. explosion. Absolutely, yes, indeed uh, I, we I did. can't remember the number this morning, but they reckon that uh, explosion of that volcano was like nine megatons or something. It, yes, it was something of that that order. It oh, was uh, it was big. It's actually quite interesting. It's a volcano that has been well studied by astrobiologists um, and re- uh, relating it to uh, to studies on Mars. I looked at this in some detail four or five years ago uh, for a talk I was doing. Uh, the volcano is called uh, Tonga Hunga Tonga Haapai. Uh, so I remember its name. Uh, and it's, it's unusual because it's an underwater volcano. And apparently most underwater volcanoes, when they erupt, through the sea surface, they, they might build a, a cone that that actually projects above the ocean surface. Yeah, but they tend only to last a matter of months or or years. They don't last long. Whereas um, Tonga Hunga has uh, actually had um, very long lasting uh, cinder cones, and it's something to do with the chemical composition of the material that came up, the magma. And the, the um, astrobiologists and, and uh, planetary scientists have related that to Mars because they see f- similar phenomena mm. on the surface of Mars, places where uh, um, uh, it, it looks as though there's been you know, a, an ocean or at least a sea with a volcano that has projected through it and actually lasted rather than je- getting demolished. That's fascinating. I think Krakatoa was a similar kind of volcano. Yes, that's Look, probably right. Like only a couple of years ago, uh, the newer version of Krakatoa yeah, did. Um, yeah. blew up and caused a tsunami and yeah. a similar story. Uh, one of the other undersea volcanoes that seems to have a permanent cone is the White Island Crater near New Zealand, yeah. which sadly made the news for all the wrong reasons a couple yeah, of years ago right. as well when tourists got caught in a, um, a sudden explosion there and um, many lives were lost. But um, they are fascinating things, volcanoes. I, I am captivated by them but um, and, and have been up close and personal with a few. But yeah, me uh, too. very dangerous thing to do. They're a very dangerous thing. Um, and, of course, Mars, the home of the biggest volcano in, in the solar system, solar system Olympus <laughs> Mars, right. which can, can, is just it, fascinating. Can I add a postscript, sure. Andrew, which is only related to what we've been saying because it's to do with Mars? 
Uh, but I've just um, received a news report today that uh, you remember the uh, subsurface lake, uh, which was detected, yeah, th- thought to be detected by um, Mars Express, uh, the radar s- signals coming back from what looked like a liquid water surface underneath the uh, Antarctic ice on Mars apparently has now been debunked um no! the, yeah the 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 um there's been work done that shows that this kind of uh this kind of uh reflection comes all over the place on mars in regions where you could not expect to find liquid water oh. uh, and the thinking is that it's actually a bright reflection coming from uh, perhaps an, uh, an iron-rich lava flow underneath the ice uh, on Mars. That's stop, stop press results, Andrew, and it's very disappointing. Very di- so that <laughs> means Mars doesn't have nearly as much water as we thought. Is that what I, you're saying? I, uh, well, certainly not liquid water. Right. Um, there is still, you know, there's still a permafrost. Mars still is very rich in ice, but uh, it was the possible existence of liquid water that had, had everybody excited, but it looks as though that might have gone away now. Mm. Okay. Uh, but, you know, in what we've been discussing, uh, it does show that studying Mars can be beneficial to Earth because we Indeed. can learn a lot about what happens to Mars and therefore yeah. um, relate it to potential to happenings Earth. here on our own planet. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, have you visited the Space Nuts website recently? It's um, always on the go, always something to see or do or read or uh, you know become interactive with. Uh, you can obviously send us messages and questions through uh, our interface there. Uh, you can also click on the Astronomy Daily tab, which I'm doing right now, and because of my incredible internet speed, I'll get back to you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> There it is. Now, um, this is where you can get up-to-date stories on what's happening in the astronomical world. Uh, And, uh, yeah, they refresh um, multiple times uh, a day, which is um, uh, very good for uh, people who just love astronomy and space science. Uh, One thing I never fail to mention is the Space Nuts shop. Uh, Click on the shop tab and uh, all the Space Nuts memorabilia you could possibly hoard in your house to upset your other half is there. So, uh, And some of it we've got. Fred's pointing at his uh, shirt now with the Space Nuts logo on it. Uh, I've got my mug in the background and the tote bag's hanging there somewhere. Yeah, there it is. It's behind my chair. But, uh, yes, plenty of things on the Space Nuts um, website. Oh, you can get stickers too, bubble free. I've uh, put one on my telescope. So, um, yeah, uh, visit us soon, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Now, Fred, uh, let's talk about the rotation of stars. Um, as I understand it, this this is actually something that's um, in certain aspects quite a, mis- uh, a mystery when you're talking about... Um, things like stellar rotation, uh, but also the the rate of rotation of various stars uh, is also the subject of much, um, well, I won't say debate, but speculation and and study. And, and this is ongoing, but a new study has just been published into trying to solve some of the mysteries of star rotation. Yeah, that's right. It's something, Andrew, that um, we haven't spoken about uh, very much, the rotation of stars, although it was... Uh, quite a big part of uh, some of the s- studies I was involved with uh, when we did big surveys of the of the spectra, the you know the the, the rainbow spectra with that barcode of information, the spectra of of uh, well um, half a million stars. Um, uh, the, let me just start by how how do you measure the rotation of a star when you can't see the disk of the star, mm. um, and what what it well, I'll step back one step further, if I may, <laughs> uh, because the the rotation of the sun is pretty easy to measure because, of course, we see the sun as a disk. Yes. And it was when early astronomers uh, 
notice sunspots, uh, which are carried across the sun's disk by the sun's rotation. That made uh, determining the rotation period of the sun fairly easy. It's actually, um, I think it's 27 days at the equator and much slower at the poles, more than 30 at the poles. Uh, but it's, it's rotational velocity at the surface. Um, and, and if you think of the equator, it's about two kilometers per second. Uh, that's um, you know the the speed with which uh, the limb of the sun is coming towards you when you if you were looking at its equator right mm -hmm. at the extreme edge of the sun two kilometers per second, um, but um, with stars other stars and, and especially massive stars that number can reach hundreds of kilometers per second so they're much more rapid rotators than the sun the sun's a, a very gentle rotator. But um, the, so the question is that I was about to answer myself is how do we measure the rotation of stars when you can't see the disk of the star? You can't track sunspots or star spots across it. And what you do is, as I mentioned, you use the this magical machine which we call a spectrograph or a spectrometer uh, on a large telescope. And what the spectrograph does is gives you a spectrum of the star. This uh, We don't look at them in colour, but if we did, there'd be deep red at one end and deep violet at the other. Um, and you've got these dark features in them, which are what we call absorption lines. They're caused by uh, the elements within the star's atmosphere actually absorbing, absorbing light of a particular colour, and colour equates to wavelength. Um, now, um, that uh, spectrum is affected by all kinds of things, most notably the chemical composition of the of the star. So you get different elements in different ratios uh, for different kind of chemistries in the atmosphere. And that was really the first thing that the, the very early spectroscopists uh, d discovered uh, when they started uh, look, pointing spectrographs at stars in the 1860s. William Huggins was the great name associated with that uh, in London. So that's one thing. You can get the temperature of the star by uh, looking at the um, how intense the spectrum lines are. Uh, but you can also deduce the rotation of the star um, so, um, uh, in fact, I've left a step out because you can tell the speed of the star as well, whether it's moving towards or away from us, uh, by where those spectrum lines appear in the spectrum. They're shifted to the red for objects going away from us and to the blue for objects coming towards us. So you can measure that shift, uh, and it gives you the velocity of the star along the line of sight. And it's a, a relative of that. If you look in detail at the shape of these spectrum lines, how how deep they are, how steep-sided they are, if I can put it that way, then that allows you to measure the rotation. Because as you can imagine, if you've got a star that's rotating at hundreds of kilometers per second, um, one side of it's coming towards you at that speed, the other side's going away from you at that speed. So what it does is that broadens out the spectrum lines uh, in the spectrum of the star. And you can measure uh, the amount of that broadening, and that gives you the rotation velocity. So that's a long-winded way of explaining how we measure with quite high accuracy uh, the rotation velocities of stars. And indeed, it's something, as I said, I've been involved with. Something else I was involved with um, was the technique of using fiber optics to measure uh, to, to analyze the light of many stars simultaneously. And we did that with our telescopes at the um, Australian Astronomical Observatory, the Anglo-Australian Telescope, and the UK Schmidt Telescope uh, were both equipped. In fact, they, they, they both still are equipped with uh, machines that let you measure hundreds of stars at once. But um, in China, they have uh, an instrument, a telescope. It's not actually that far from Beijing. It's about 100 kilometers away, uh, which is called the Large Sky Area Multi-Object Fiber Spectroscopic Telescope. And that uh, is, uh, abbreviates to an acronym, LAMOST. And uh, I have a connection with LAMOST, and that's the, because of the work I did on building fiber optic spectroscopy systems and using them. I was very privileged to sit on a couple of the uh, the you know oversight committees that this telescope had back in the early 2000s. So it's something close to my heart. And okay, let's cut to the chase. Are you still there, Andrew? I'm, I'm sure you are. Yeah. I'm because <laughs> oh, I, yes, you are. I, I read this report twice, and I'm still struggling to comprehend. Okay, it. good. Well, <laughs> jokes aside, I'm finding it. It really just is a, a bit much for my brain. <laughs> Um, well, the, the, the easy bit is that what they've done with LAMOST is measured uh, 
the properties by looking at these spectra of 40,000 massive stars. Mm -hmm. And so what they've been able to do is analyze the rotation of those stars. And um, th that's something you can, you know, you can look at in detail in connection with the chemical composition of those stars. So this is the trick um, that um, you, you've you got so much data, and it's why we do these big surveys, that you can say, okay, we've got this range of rotations, and we've got this range of what we in the trade call chemical abundance. That's the just the chemical mix in the atmospheres of these stars. And you can ask the question, are they related? That's, that's what this is all about. And, um, well, that's that's actually something that has got uh, a, you know a, a, some interesting outcomes. Now, I have to say that this is still a work in progress, Andrew, and that might be why you're struggling to to get anything out of it because there's no. That's a good excuse. There's I'll, no. I'll go with that. <laughs> there's no gotcha thing at the end. There's a kind of semi gotcha, but um, so there's nothing that says, "Look, this is a new result." What they're doing, they they they've. they've They've built this huge catalog of forty thousand massive stars, and they're with all their intimate details uh, of each star, and they're combining the data to look at where the links are. Um, and so, one of the things that people have suspected before is that stars that have a slightly unusual chemistry—they've got, um, you know, perhaps more iron than you'd expect in their spectrum, uh, or something of that sort. Um, that they are actually their rotation is also slower. Ah. Um, uh, now that's something that uh, the uh, actually one of the uh, the lead scientists are on this work. Uh, um, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, it's uh, Sun. I think it's Wai Wai Hia uh, from Peking University and the National Ob uh, Astronomical Observatories of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which operates LOMOST. Uh, um, Sun says, uh, our study, um, let me put it this way. Actually, let me read um, a couple of things because there's some very good comments made here. Fast rotation is ubiquitous among massive stars. Um, our study provides clues for understanding how the angular momentum of massive stars evolves during the majority of its lifetime. Now, what the angular momentum is, is the rotational energy. It's not just the speed of rotation. It's how that combines with the, the mass of the star to make, you know, a, an energy of rotation. Mm -hmm. And we all know, um, because we've all read Space Warp, <laughs> uh, the angular momentum is conserved. And you know that because I bet you've done this uh, at some time in your uh, in your past, Andrew, sat on an office chair which rotates and spun yourself around with your legs stretched out and then brought them brought your legs in oh, and, you, and your rotation speeds up. The ballerina spin. That's exactly it, yes, the ballerina spin. And that's because of this thing called the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, you've got, um, you know, uh, uh, you, the same angular momentum with your legs stretched out and a, and a slow rotation as you have when your legs are tucked in and a fast rotation. Mm. And that's, that's what this quantity is about. And so what the – sorry, For the on. record, I've never done it. Oh, come on, you must have no. done it. Never done it. <laughs> I do it every day. I've got an office chair in here. I have got a, a swinging chair here right now, but I am not going to do it. <laughs> you, you need to be – you've got to be a bit careful, otherwise you end up in a well, heap on the floor. A with, lot of sensitive equipment around exactly, that. With, you know, I certainly don't want to put my telescope through the wall. <laughs> exactly. It's not worth it for that, no, but it's, um, you know, take it outside the door or something, then everybody thinks you've lost it, so that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um, – the studies are all about, um, you know, that this angular uh, momentum, um, how the properties of these stars um, uh, can be can be linked together. So, Sun, uh, the the uh, principal author of this work, goes on to say um, that they've got this property of four, uh, you know, this catalog of forty thousand. 40,000 massive stars. Such a catalog will reform our understanding of massive star evolution. Um, our data challenges the idea that stars with peculiar chemical abundance are all slow rotators. That's something that's been built up over the years that people think that, but mm. actually they're saying this is probably not the case. Um, and so 
um, what this is really telling you uh, is um, it, it's likely in the end to give us real insights into how uh, stars behave below their surface. These hot, massive stars, they've got um, <clears throat> convection regions under the surface, and that clearly is going to affect the rotation of the star. And so, you know, if you can show how that depends on chemical composition, then it may give you an idea of the way chemical composition has changed over the history of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and to, to see how, if you, you, know, you, com you compare younger and older stars uh, and stars of certain chemical compositions with stars of certain other chemical compositions and look how the rotation uh, varies, what it might mean in the future is that you've got a, a relatively easy uh, diagnostic of chemistry and chemical history in a star by looking at the rotation of it. That's, I think, the end product of where this work is going. I'm kind uh -huh. of reading, reading a li little bit between the lines there. Yeah. Uh, but that would be the kind of thing that might come out of this work. So it's great stuff. And I'm thrilled that it's uh, on a telescope that had a little bit to do with a few mm. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to read the full report, it's been published uh, in the Astrophysical Journal, so um, that's where you can get a hold of it. Uh, now, I, I did have a question um, based on something you were saying, and that was the uh, speed of rotation of our sun, which was two kilometres per second. I, I, just a hypothetical question popped in my head, and you know how much I love hypotheticals. <laughs> what <laughs> impact would it have on our planet if the sun were faster? than two kilometres per second in its rotation. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, that's a really interesting question because it relates to the type of star that it is. Our, our sun is a, effectively a, a, a dwarf star. Um, it's not that much of a dwarf. It's not, certainly not a red dwarf, but it's not comparable with these really massive stars. And so the massive stars are the fast rotators. So then you'd have a star that was highly luminous um, the Goldilocks zone would be a lot further out in the solar system than it is uh, with the sun. Uh, it, it would have definitely had an effect. Mm. And something else that um, happens with these fast rotators uh, is that they they are they're not spherical. They're slightly fatter at the equator than they are at the poles. Um, actually, planets are like that too. Because of the rotation, you've got the centrifugal effect that tends yep. to push it out. Whereas the sun, and you and I have spoken about this before, and probably because of its slow rotation, is one of the most perfectly spherical bodies known of any kind, not just in the universe, anywhere in nature. Uh, its, its equatorial radius is only less than 10 kilometres different from its polar radius, and the thing's 1.3 million kilometres in diameter. That's it's amazing. staggeringly spherical, yeah. yeah. You compare that to Earth. I mean, our bulge yeah. is quite a Yes, it's, quite, it's quite, quite big, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. All right. Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now, uh, something uh, I have been talking about of late is leaving reviews about Space Nuts on your favourite podcast distributor. Uh, and you can now include Spotify in that list. You can leave a review on Spotify. And uh, I got a note the other day from someone who said, I left a review for you. I gave you one star. You suck. <laughs> no, um, it was really nice. So uh, oh, good. <laughs> that, That's really... that is now a possibility. <laughs> so if you, it uh, doesn't matter who you listen through, if they uh, accept reviews on podcasts, uh, please give us a review. We'd love to um, get more and more people involved in Space Nuts and apparently reviews really help uh, when people are looking for new podcasts to listen to and uh, we would be most grateful if you would do that. Uh, and you can just yeah, do it through whichever podcast platform you prefer. Now, Fred, we've got some questions. We're going to head to uh, a place called Maruchidor. Now, Ooh. most people in the world <laughs> go, Maru Mar what? Maruchidor, very popular location in Queensland. And this is Ken. Hi, Professor Fred and Dr Dunkley. It's Ken from Maruchidor, Queensland. And I'm wondering about radio telescopes. I can understand how a short wavelength radio telescope with a parabolic dish can focus on an object, but how does a long wave radio telescope like the field in the square kilometre array focus onto a particular object? Thanks for a great show. Thank you, Ken. Um, 
Fred's face lit up when he heard your question. Because, uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know this is an area he's very, very keen on. Yeah, although um, I'm not the expert on this because, um, you know, my uh, stock in trade is optical astronomy, visible light astronomy, where you, you know whether the thing's in focus or not. Uh, you've got a reflective mirror that's focusing the light onto whatever detector you have, and um, that, that it, it works with, it, with the normal properties of optics, as do uh, high-frequency uh, or mid-frequency um, uh, radio telescopes, like the ASCAP telescopes, the, the dishes of the ASCAP telescope. But um, it is fascinating when you get down to lower frequencies, and uh, that means longer wavelengths, um, where you're measuring the wavelengths in, in centimetres or, or even metres. Um, you, you then um, tend not to be building big dishes, although... You know, we've seen big dishes like the Arecibo dish, and the and the that was the three hundred meter uh, dish in the in the ground in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, which fell fell to bits a couple of years ago, very sadly. Uh, and um, another big dish is the Fast Radio Telescope in China, which is a five hundred meter dish, always pointing upwards. Uh, that's kind of the limits that you can go to with these. Uh, low frequency uh, telescopes, but it turns out then to be much better uh, to um, to do what the ask sorry what the square kilometer array telescopes are doing, uh, and there's a there's um, a number of precursors with that. So what you've got uh, for the square, uh, let me just uh, give you the background. Uh, square kilometer array has two components. One in South Africa, which is SKA mid, they look at the mid frequencies. Uh, the other component here in Australia will be SKA low. Uh, that's in Murchison in Western Australia. The mid frequencies, uh, the telescopes there are similar to the ASCAP dishes, the different in arrangement, but they they do have a, a parabolic reflector. Uh, uh, which focuses essentially light onto a detector. Sorry, focuses radio mid-frequency radio radiation onto a detector. The um, low frequency, however, is just these paddocks of antennas. Yes. And so, the, the, you know, the question, how on earth do you decide which object you're looking at, is a great one because they're just they're dipoles. That's essentially what they are. They're uh, and a, a dipole aerial is just um, the 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 most basic kind of radio aerial. We used to see, and I suppose to some extent we still do, see houses festooned with dipole areas for their TVs. Yep. Uh, in fact, we've got one on the roof here. Um, so if you think of uh, those things, but sort of pointing upwards, what you've got is uh, with a single antenna, you've got something that will, will actually respond to radio radiation coming in from anywhere in the sky. So one dipole antenna can see uh, you know the whole two pi steradians to give the technical term the the um, the you know angular uh, uh, area of the sky you can see the whole sky but if you have an array of them mm. what you can do is in a sense it's it's like reading them out it's all done with fancy things called correlators and things of that sort but what you can do is you can time the readout of the signal from each of these single antennas, and you've got thousands of them. Um, it's gosh, I'm I'm struggling to remember the number. I think it's three hundred and twelve thousand that the uh, uh, SKA will have uh, of those antennas. That's terrible. That's usually on the tip of my tongue. It's somewhere in there, Andrew. I've probably given the wrong number. Never mind. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's many, many thousands. Um, so you've got all these antennas. Yes, thank you. He's Googling it. I can see. <laughs> 256. <laughs> no, that's that's the that's the Murchison Widefield Array, I think, or, or one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the. Um... All right, mm. let me let me look for it. I can find it. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Talk among yourselves. Yes, I do this on air all the time at the radio station. <laughs> do you? Oh, constantly. Oh, dear. I've reached um, that age where I forget to put music on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we are. Uh, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong thing, but it'll give me the answer, I hope. Where are we? Here we are. Uh, 
It is. I got the three right, Andrew. It's 130,000. Oh, there not 300,000. There you are. 130,000. Um, wow. I was just slightly optimistic. Of these, of, and they look like Christmas trees. That's because they've got the, the short wavelength dipoles at the top and the long wavelength dipoles at the bottom. So you've mm. got fields of 130,000 Christmas trees. Um, and what you do is what I've just said uh, for each wavelength that you're looking at, because these things, uh, you know, they look at different frequencies. For each wavelength you're looking at, you can time what the antennas are doing so that you steer it electronically. Effectively, that's what it amounts to. You can point the beam in different directions. And the really cunning bit, which I love, is you can look at different bits of the sky at the same time uh, because, you you know, you can you – can, um, handle the signals in different ways. So you're pointing the telescope simultaneously at more than one object. Mm. It, yeah, wow. To be honest, I, you know, not being a, a radio astronomy engineer, um, I, I find this quite dazzling and quite breathtaking uh, that, that it works and it works really well. Um, there is an, uh, a, a, a Pathfinder uh, array, which is called the Murchison Wide Field Array. It works in the same low frequency band as the SKA will. That's already it's been operating, I think, for probably almost 10 years, and it's done fantastic work uh, with, um, I think, about 4,000 antennas, uh, which don't look like Christmas trees. They look like a bunch of coat hangers that somebody's <laughs> kind of put on the ground. It's really weird, but very great, excellent science. And as I said, I'm blown away by what my radio colleagues do with all this stuff. Mm. All right. I hope that uh, helps, Ken. It's not yeah, a very good description. Yeah. Well, now Ken knows how to focus a radio telescope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks, Ken. Lovely to hear from you. And now we're off to the United States. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Fred. This is Jacob from Phoenix. Um, I had a question in regard to uh, rogue planets and uh, I guess the time frame in which we see them. So as we know, like light takes a while to get to us. Um, even if we're looking at far off planets, we're able to make observations of them, but um, my question is, does their state change, you know, based off of the time that we've seen them? So if we see a planet, um, you know, far back as maybe a <clears throat> hundred years away from us or whatever it may be, let's just say it's far away from us. Is it, is there a chance perhaps that that rogue planet is now developed or oriented into something that is suitable for life? Is that possible? Um, it may be low level for Fred. He might be like, well, absolutely not. But I just wanted to ask because I'm just very interested in like maybe some of these exoplanets um, that we feel may not be suitable for life may be at this point in time, given that it's been so long since we've been able to make the observation and, and their actual state. So I um, hope the question makes sense. <laughs> It's kind of the morning here. We're rushing around, so just wanted to get that off my uh, get off my, get that off my mind because I've been thinking about it for a while. Thank you guys. Love your podcast. Go nuts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Look, don't worry about how low brow your questions are. He answers all of mine, so it doesn't get lower than that. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Too. It is a ripper. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I think um, you know perhaps just to, uh, usually by rogue planets we mean planets that don't have a, a parent star mm. for whatever reason we don't really know <clears throat> we we've got ideas about how they form some might form because they've been or they might have been kicked out of a, a solar system by gravitational interactions some might just be the debris left over when stars form we don't we don't know uh, but the bottom line is indeed that uh, uh, planets a long way away we are seeing them as they were in the past Yep. Um, now, typically, the exoplanets, the planets of other stars that we observe, their distances are measured in hundreds or low numbers of thousands of light years. Um, and so we are seeing them as they were, say, at most for two, two or 3,000 years ago. And that's really not long enough to have any significant change in the geological or or the you know the, the circumstances in w within which the star the planet might find itself if you if you if you do think about the way uh planets might drift about in their solar systems and we think that sort of migration of planets backwards and forwards inside solar systems we think that does take place but it's a process that takes place over millions of years rather than the kind of length of time that we are talking about when we talk about exoplanets, the, the look-back times. So if you were detecting exoplanets in other galaxies and one or two candidates have been 
have been proposed for exoplanets in other galaxies. But supposing you found an exoplanet in the Andromeda galaxy, which is about two and a half million light years away, then yes, you might well be able to say that conditions on that planet could be much different now from what um, they were when the light left it, the, the, mm. the light that we're observing. Um, so it is possible, uh, Jacob, that the answer to your question is yes, but not for the vast majority of exoplanets, which are actually in our own neighbourhood. And, you know, you're only looking back, in some cases, uh, only 10 or 12 years. It's not, it's not a long look back time because yeah, they're relatively close. Yeah, that's too short for any kind of evolution to a habitable world or something like that well it could be you know if you've got if you've got um uh, if you've got periods of hundreds or thousands of years it's long enough for uh, a civilization to trash its planet and um, <laughs> change it that way it but, only took us uh yeah 200 yeah, years that's right <laughs> yes well no actually it took longer because they they've actually uh, i read a study late last year that suggested that um, the the increasing the global warming effect caused by humans has been going on for longer than two hundred years. They they think it probably dates down uh, dates back thousands of years because of our practice of burning off forest burning stuff, and, yeah, and things yeah. like that. So yep. Yep. It, it's not just the last few generations that are responsible. It goes back no. a lot further. But they've done the. The real damage. The industrial revolution has a lot to oh, answer yeah, we, for. Oh yeah, we certainly accelerated it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now we're trying to decel very, very quickly. Very much so. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, Jacob. Uh, we finished with Jacob, didn't we? Yeah, we that, 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 that's a great question with with a variety of answers. <laughs> very good. Thanks, Jacob. Lovely to hear from you, and thanks to everybody who uh, sends us questions. We've got a few more, so we'll uh, get stuck into them in the coming weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, just one more thing, of course, and that is if you do want to get in touch with us, you can do that via our website. Uh, just go to spacenutspodcast.com and click on the AMA tab or on the right-hand side, send us your voice message. So you can send us voice messages through either um, option or you can send us texts or emails, if you like, via the AMA tab on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Fred, that brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure as always. A lot of fun, Andrew, and uh, that's why we do it. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Certainly don't do it for the big bucks. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. We'll catch you next week, Fred. Thank Sounds you. Sounds great. See you soon. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and uh, I haven't said hi to Hugh in the studio in recent times, so hi, Hugh. Keep up the good work, whatever it is you do. And from <laughs> me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you so much. We'll catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast. Player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. <laughs>